I'm Lindsay Preston, co-host of Story Mantra, and we are continuing our conversation from last week. I'm going to first introduce my co-host, Andrew Gatani, author of Duty and Desire. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, Aparna. Welcome, Greg. Um, Anju here, and I am super thrilled to once again um, introduce you to the executive director of Raksha. She's been the executive director since 1998, Aparna Bhattacharya. Um, Aparna, could you tell us a little bit about your role, responsibilities, and what Raksha does? Um, sure. And then we can um, transition to Greg and see what um, you know he has to offer for men stopping violence. Sure, Raksha, which means protection in many South Asian languages, is a community-based nonprofit that works towards healing, um, justice, and empowerment for South Asian survivors. And we do that by offering counseling, advocacy, support services, but we also do training within the community, within and outside of the community about working with survivors and um, issues that impact immigrant survivors of violence. Thank you, Aparna. And for all of you who want a more detailed um, you know, information on, on Raksha and also on Aparna, um, I have to slip this in there because it's too exciting not to, but she's a White House champion of change in 2013. Um, numerous award winner, recipient of, you know, um, several honors. And for Greg, Greg Lachlan, I couldn't be more proud to introduce him. He's the director of community engagement for Men Stopping Violence. Um, and Greg has appeared in Atlanta Journal-Constitution, NBC, WSBTV. Greg, could you please tell us a little about the work that you do and your organization? Sure. So Men Stopping Violence has been around for 38 years. Our mission is to engage men and communities to take action to end violence against women. So we have both classes for men that men can attend who have used abusive and controlling behaviors and want to change. So if somebody's hit a wall or somebody wants to change, we have classes that work with men to do that. Uh, but we also have you know, we also work on the community level as well. We have a program called the Emoja Hour, which is a free program for black and brown men to get together and focus on wellness, you know, as black and brown men are under assault from COVID-19 and chronic racial injustice. So we have a free spot to focus on wellness there. We have a program called the Huddle, where men in the community can get together and focus on wellness and being non-abusive. So we, we have a lot of programs. We're here in Atlanta and we'd love to, to work with men. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> um, and we'll share the links of, uh, you'll find the links just below the video um, for both organizations. And, you know, as a writer and creator of a story which deals with emotional, physical abuse um, and also goes into PTSD, um, as it's really hard to understand the psyche of abusers and victims. Um, but that's what these two episodes is about. This is the second episode of the first, uh, following on from when Greg Lachlan talked more about the abuser's perspective, why they abuse, um, how does it come about, where does it stem from? And of course, he validated for us that abusers are really people after all at the end of the day, um, and it's just an imprint. And it could be a pathological or a psychic imprint, which is unfortunately stamped forever which as he explained, um, is very hard to break. Isn't that true, Greg? Isn't that where we left off, sort of? I think it is. I think it's more about kind of male socialization and training that gets ingrained and then men learn to be abusive and can unlearn it as well. And so, yeah, I think I would just add that to what you said. <laughs> I'm Lindsay. Yeah, so that is kind of where we left off and talking about that. We were saying also at the end of our last session is that the community, you don't see very many people stand up in the community and tell the abuser that they are doing the wrong thing or that it's not the right way to behave. What would you like to tell authors? What would you like us to be able to get across to people in our books? Is there something you wish you saw more in our stories? Arna, you had some great points at the break around that. I'm wondering if you'd be willing to go first. Well, I think I think it's it's kind of like a slippery, a tightrope of some sort, right? So we can talk about community members being engaged, but we have to look at what is their relationship with the individual? What kind of influence will they have 
and and I know that like I, I can think of a couple of stories where men in our, in the South Asian community have like approached somebody, and it's it's supposedly worked out well. But then I can also think about situations in my own family where men have approached other men that you know, and maybe because they are more linked to the the person who's being abused, um, it didn't always work well. You know, sometimes it, it like it ended in a rift in the family and, and folks didn't talk for a while when, you know, for example, my father and, and another uncle intervened in a situation um, and tried to help the family member that was being abused. But the family member who was being abused didn't want the help. And then there was a lot of conflict. So it can go either way. I've, I, we've definitely heard stories of where it can make a change and the situation gets better. But then I've also heard the situations where it can also make the situation worse, where it could be more dangerous because suddenly there you're airing dirty laundry and folks are upset that other folks may know what's going inside the home. Greg, do you want to add to that? I agree. I mean, the question there is always, you know, what about her and how does this affect her and what does that look like? And, you know, I still want a society where men you know, say to each other, when a man disrespects a woman or, you know, says something about their partner, another guy says, wow, you know, maybe it's not even in the presence of, of the woman, but where men kind of check each other and hold each other to a higher standard, you know, because I think for too long, men have bonded around disrespecting women. And what would it be like for men to bond around and care about each other and bond around respecting women and respecting each other. And so it's an incredibly, like Aparna said, an incredibly difficult, you know, tightrope to walk, um, you know, because how do men do that where, and still, you know, what about her and, and what about her safety? And so anyway, um, it, it's difficult. And yet I think that's the kind of community that, that I want, you know. And that's what we should be working towards, right? And I think it also depends on the level of violence that's occurring in the home. Like I think about my own father, who I think I felt used violence um, at times. He grew up around violence, you know, where my my grandfather was known to have a temper. And, and if my aunt puts uh, sugar instead of salt in the food, he would throw the plate against the wall, right? And I. I think about when, when I started doing this work and the family member that my dad started to shift. And my dad had a bit of a temper and I was scared of him. I remember if I cut my hand or something happened, I would be scared to tell him because I would hear, you know, this yelling and that yelling came out of his fear, right? But if I slammed a door in my household, he would have such a reaction because it reminded him of his own father. And so that would be a way, that would be a trigger for him. That if I, I send a door, he's like, don't do that because it reminded him of his father's outbursts. But I think with me doing this work, my father had his own realizations. So I, I really think it's also the level of violence that's being used and how the power and control plays out. Um, that I think that there can be the subtle changes that happen when we have supportive community members that come at us in a loving way, not an attacking way, right? Because we all respond to love. If Greg is to tell me something and he tells me out of love, I'm more likely to hear it than I'm gonna hear it from somebody who doesn't know me and who is throwing accusations at me. And I think that's the important thing of like, how do we make those interventions and where, what do we personally respond to when, when we're messing up or when we're not doing something right? Because there's that shame that comes out and that'll make me angry or get me defensive or have me react a certain way. Greg, would you want to add to that? I think that's beautiful around what's the connection and, you know, if I come at another man and my goal is to put him down, you know, if I think he's being abusive and so my goal is to shut him down or to, to beat him in some way, what am I teaching him? that it's just, just because I may be bigger or in a position power, it's my right to disrespect him or to put him down. What's he learning from that? So it is, it's all about connection and it's all about care at the same time that there's accountability. I mean, my own story, I went, you know, I, I got attached to men stopping violence and I had learned, you know, all of these 
beliefs about women that I had ingrained. And it wasn't until I got to Men Stopping Violence that there was a group of men that I thought were really, really cool. And they were like, you can be part of this community. We want you here, but only, you know, we're not gonna let you disrespect women here. And it was the one place where there were men that said, hey, we're a community, we love you, but if you disrespect women or say something negative, you know, we're all gonna check each other as part of a positive community. And I wanted to be there. You know, I wanted to, to be part of that community. And so how do we create those, those kind of positive influences as well? Lizzie, what are we going to focus on on this episode? There's just so many topics we can yeah, get into. It's so thrilling and exciting. But I think a community is a good way to kind of switch over because we just talked about how a community could, could either help or actually deter an abuser. What about the community surrounding the, um, typically the woman who is being abused? What can we do both as writers to, to, to portray them accurately, but more importantly, make them feel safe and make them feel like they can come forward and do that? Because I think the community is probably even more important for them once they're already in the cycle. Absolutely. And I think, you know, we once did a project where we had survivors talk about the things that people said to them that was that was harmful and the things that really uplifted them and what community can do to help survivors, number one, see their own power. I think one of the things we often see in community and even for people who want to come and volunteer for our organization is they want to be the savior. Right. They want to be the one that helps give the advice to, to help this person get out. And, and I, I'd be lying and saying that I didn't see myself that way when I first started doing this work. Right. But the reality is the power has to come from the individual themselves who's being from within. Right. right? Um, and, and like Greg was saying, it's, it's we know that sometimes there's same sex violence. There's so many ways to look at it, but we'll say women. <laughs> um, but from the end of the woman herself for her to find her power and we hear stories of it's the co-worker that continues to remind them of their power and tell them how talented they are so that's counteracting the, the message they're getting in their home right aparna let me ask you you talked about um the cycle the cycle mm -hmm. of abuse you mentioned it briefly for us as writers what is this cycle and how does, how does a person in that situation who is so ingrained in that situation, while well, you have Greg's perspective of the abuser who is so ingrained in the imprint that he's been taught from the beginning, how does the victim then break out and wake up from that, um, whether with or without the community, because it's a vicious cycle, as you just said. So one, what is the cycle that we need to understand and learn? And two, how do we come out? Well, and I think that, you know, there's a cycle and Greg can correct me on this. I mean, there's, there's a cycle of violence, which is a framework, but it's not true for every situation, if that makes any sense. And, and the cycle is basically there's a buildup of, you know, up until there's a, an explosion of violence, right? So that slowly the little things that happen and you can feel the tension building. Then there's an actual explosion of violence, which could be physical, it could be emotional, it could be some big thing that happens, right? And then there might be a honeymoon stage. And, and I sometimes question if that honeymoon stage exists, because there might be many factors where it may not exist, um, especially in some marriages where um, there's a whole bunch of power and, and the individual doesn't even feel like they have to win back the love of the, you know, the person that they're abusing. So I, um, you know, so there's that honeymoon stage of I'll do what it takes. I will go to classes. I will take you on this great vacation. Let me buy you a brand new house, whatever that is, right? Um, I will go to counseling. I will go to batter's intervention. And that then, you know, so everything's fine for a while. And then of course to go back to the tension building stage. Now that can happen one time in a relationship or it can be an ongoing cycle. So there's one story that's often told about this one violent incident that happened over the holidays. And this is something that happened in Atlanta. And it never had to happen again, but what the abuser would do was always remind that individual about Thanksgiving, where he broke all the china, 
horrific act of violence and just reminded her whenever he thought she, he thought she was veering or he was losing control of her, he would just remind her of that one incident. So it's just re-triggering the trauma, isn't it? Yes. So there's just subtle ways in which you can remind someone of their power um, or that I have a way to, to show power. But like, I think in some, some marriages, I don't even think there's that honeymoon stage, right? I think about someone who may have brought a wife. I mean, it, it just might depend on the power dynamic. You could think of somebody who's got so much power and privilege that they don't feel like they have to win them back because they have so much power over the other individual. Maybe that, you know, you don't speak English, you don't do this, you know, you don't have immigration status. Yeah. And so it becomes the new normal for that victim, which is what Greg had um, said, which was so shocking when he said that woman uh, preferred not to be saved by the policeman because she knew how to survive in this level of fear that she was living in, which became her normal. And that goes back to the experts know their situation probably better than anybody else does like we from the outside can think that we're there to help them but the reality is they've been surviving already without us right so they know how to maneuver the situation they know when that violence might be coming right well because they're living on eggshells they're walking on eggshells the whole time but then where does that awakening happen because it's a normal so how, where, when, you know. It might be a realization, it might be a risk. Sometimes, and Greg, you can you can add in, but it could be maybe they realize that their children are, da are in danger. So some, some survivors decide to leave because they realize their child is at risk, right? And, and to say that they haven't left before, they may have tried to leave before, but it may have blown up in their faces, like that they may have come back or something may have happened. So the reason they may stay in is actually to keep themselves safe because we don't know what they're afraid of, right? Mm. I'm going to take your children away or I'm going to do this or, or you know, I'm going to tell everybody you did X, Y, Z or the whole church will know. Oh, I have this video of you because now we've got technology, right? Where people are sending messages and I will show everybody this, you know, video of you doing X, Y, Z. So thinking about all those things, we don't know what that abuser is holding or what that person using violence is holding over the person who is receiving the violence. So Greg and Lindsay, would you say then that the fear of the known is more comforting than the fear of the unknown? Aparna? How do you? I think that's absolutely true. Yeah, I think, I mean, I would agree with that. I also, I co-coordinated the Georgia Domestic Violence Fatality Review Project. And in almost every case we reviewed where a woman was killed by a man, she had taken some step to leave. You know, maybe it was an emotional leaving. Maybe she was applying to go to graduate school. Maybe she was, you know, um, changing her locks. Whatever it was, there was some step to leave. And that's when she was killed. And so I think Anju, that did, that's a very concrete kind of um, confirmation of what you're saying, that, that the known may be terrifying, but the unknown could be death. And so what's your choice there? And, and depending on the situation of, of the survivor, it could be, look, I, I don't have permission to work. I have to work under the table. How am I going to survive? Right. So like if you think about immigration, how that plays in, I may not speak the language. How am I going to survive? Right. right. And then even when you get community help and I'm just telling you the stories that come out, there might be well-meaning people who want to help. And there are some that do, but there's some that also take advantage of the situation. Mm. You know, how many calls we get? Oh, I want to help somebody, but we need someone in our home to cook and clean. Really? Right? Yeah, so I mean, th those are things that have happened and we just, you know, we had to stop going, okay, we can't take those kind of calls. I mean, at first we thought, okay, well, maybe this might be a win win, but then we can't control what's going to happen when someone goes into someone else else's home. Oh, yeah, so there's yeah. this, you know, the, it's a very complicated system of like, it could take years before someone gets work authorization or legal status. And so, you know, it makes an individual more vulnerable to other abuse by other people. You know, and that's the complicated immigrant story, right? That's, 
<laughs> you know, that, that we're adding the layers in. Yeah. But I mean, that there is a total unknown and we can't guarantee that safety and we can't guarantee a roof over someone's head. We can't guarantee access to benefits because that's not true for many survivors, at least from our communities. So these survivors and these victims, um, what role does the children play for them? Because here's a question of being a good parent, you know, is it, you're trying to be a good parent and keep it all together for the safety of the children. But at the same time, in a situation which is so aggressive, are you doing them a service or a disservice? I mean, it really depends. I mean, Greg, you, I mean, with the fatality review, how many murder suicides occurred, right? Where the children are then losing both parents. Um, but then there's some situations where children thrive when they've left that situation. It really, again, it's it's the unusual dynamics we can't control. We don't know whatever the abuser, however the abuser is going to react, right? And you might have some where it might be the best thing, you know. Once the kids get out, I've seen children who, I mean, they they might be under 10 but they look way older in their face because they've taken on this role having witnessed this violence right? right then you have some kids who might side with the abuser because they like the privilege of what they're getting and sometimes are also using violence against their mom right which goes back to what greg said in the previous episode on october 20th when it's imprinting that um patriarchal kind of system in in their minds um to begin with to the next generation yeah i mean that's part of the patriarchal training to you get benefits by being in control and their benefits what we don't focus on also is the cost you know the cost to humanity the cost to relationships um, right so what happens to these victims and aparna and and greg and you know Lindsay, maybe you want to chime in as well but this is my thought what happens once they break free because you can breathe you've got freedom for you know it's overwhelming you're, you're broken out of this this lock and key system then what i mean i think it depends on each individual person right if they have a sisterhood or a family and support that can make a huge difference right if they have an opportunity to support themselves, that can make a huge difference. For some, it might be hard. I can't say it's easy for everybody because they may be struggling. I mean, I think about right now during COVID, you know, the reality is that a lot of folks are struggling just to like keep a roof over their head. You know, there's a huge need for rental assistance. And, and as, as a single parent, how are, how are a lot of survivors, you know, having to manage their young children at home and not being able to work because they may not have health insurance, they may not have many things available to them. Yeah, I mean, I think there's like Aparna is pointing to here some, I mean, it's awful to think about, but there's a hierarchy of needs. And sometimes, you know, somebody's being abused. And yet, there's other things going on too. There's COVID, there's, um, you know, uh, police brutality, there's all these other things. And so a survivor has got to make a choice on which do I tend to now and which do I hold for later. You know, the other thing I did just want to say, I think, and I think it's often true, but there's this widespread assumption that success in a domestic violence situation is when she leaves. And so I think a lot of times you're particularly mainstream domestic violence uh, organizations and the whole goal is to get her to leave and if you actually listen to to battered women or particularly women of color a lot of times they don't want to leave they just want the violence to stop and so success is not leaving success is being able to stay but for him to change his behavior and so you know, I think that also could be a goal, you know, and it's it's one that we just don't even think about. But I think if you listen to survivors a lot, that's what they want. Oh, that's really interesting. And because we are out of time, I'm going to throw one question out there for each of you to answer. For you, Greg, if for writers, if you want one thing that they really should keep in mind when writing their abusers and a partner when writing their um, they're victims of abuse. What one last bit of advice on creating these characters? 
Wow, that one kind of caught me. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I would, you know, I, I think the complexity, I think, you know, looking at the man not as a monster, but in some ways being fiercely loyal to the script that he's received from the community and looking at him within the context of those community messages that he's, he's uh, in some ways being a faithful servant to those messages and how do we, how do we see him in that way and break him out of that, Aparna? <laughs> I think that uh, the survivor is not one dimensional and that the, the, their story is not just the abuse. And I think the other thing to keep in mind is whether they leave or they stay, they're still pretty darn strong individuals to, to deal with what they're dealing with. Whether they're in, staying in the abusive situation that takes strength, just as much as it takes strength to leave. Wow, well, that's, that's really inspiring. Um, you know. And one question, which I wanted to quickly ask both of you again, um, is when we're creating these works, you know, writing a book, a novel, fiction length novel takes years, um, sometimes a decade. Um, in my case, two decades, I've been working on the series. But the, the question is, um, how does our work influence the situation and the lives of abusers and victims? So that when we're putting in all this effort, blood, sweat, toil, tears, everything. Is there somebody out there who we can help just by putting words on paper? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you're providing a vision of both what the world is that people can see themselves in and learn from, and you're providing a vision of what the world could be. And so a lot of times we spend time saying, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. But what's the, what is the world we want to live in? Or what are the examples of something different? And so I think you have an opportunity to both show things as they are now and to show things as they could be. And I'm so glad y'all are taking the time to, to, to ask questions and to, to think about those things. So that's, that's my thought. Thank you, Greg. I, I agree with Greg. Um, I think a lot of times when we hear a story or we see a story reflected, it gives us our own possibilities and it helps us deal with what we may do, what we might be dealing with in our own lives, but to see it through another lens and to see some possibilities and to also reflect of what we might be experiencing. So it can be really powerful. I, I've found that whether it's stories or movies that our community, relates more in that level than me doing a presentation but it, it, it can also inspire us and, and make us feel less alone if we are struggling so the, the beauty of a story is is it really can transcend so many different barriers and help us find our own voice so do you have any recommendations lindsay um greg and aparna for viewers out there on books or movies any form of entertainment which you feel could benefit them um, if you're doing the South Asian story, I think Tupper is a great um, movie to look at the subtle ways and the socialization that occurs and how community can be a part of either uplifting or keeping someone from telling from making a step forward. Greg, I know you had some great books you were talking about. I think Pearl Klieg, an Atlanta playwright and author, just does terrific work that shows the complexities that we're talking about and also models of men who are showing positive role models. Also, it's not fiction, but Lundy Bancroft has a book called Why Does He Do That? And it really is really, as I've heard it's been really helpful to women who are wondering why is this guy acting like this? And this book can help make sense of that. Um, why is he doing this? So I think those are two two books that I would recommend. And I will end it by saying I recommend your book, Andrew. Who do you <laughs> desire? <laughs> because I'm your greatest fan. Your first reader and your biggest fan. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> and Andrew, where can we get your book so we can read it and have more of a dialogue about it? Um, on Amazon. Okay. You can get it on Amazon. This is the 2020 version. So do not buy the 2011 version. So here's an author telling you, do not buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> That's the 2011. This is the 2020 version. And it's become a series, um, the Winds of Fire series, precisely because of everything that you both have talked about. 
you know, it starts as emotional abuse. It looks and delves into domestic physical abuse. It looks at PTSD. The story starts in India. It crosses continents, moves to America. And it talks about the concept of you can run, but you can't hide when you have so much money, power and wealth at play. The trappings of wealth become harder to run away from. That's true. And, you know, that's something that a lot of um, authors and the world doesn't know about these wealthy, wealthy Indians, um, Asian, South Asian communities that have anything and everything. Um, and the women who continue to be trapped within that framework, which goes back to everything that both of you were saying in a nutshell, patriarchal society, you know, um, keeping the norm aparna and not letting it out. You know, what will people say in Hindi? We say, yep. Lok yeah. <laughs> right? um, and just everything that you've, br you've brought into focus and the hardest bit, you know, um, which Lindsay knows is really creating these two characters, which took forever because there were so many layers to peel away from because they were both involved in this. And it wasn't just two people, it was two whole dynamic families, titanic right. families. So you, you can just kind of understand. Um, and then it took me a while to learn. You know, that's, that's in a nutshell, it really took me a while to understand. And um, my own personal favorite research that I did was Patricia Evans's book, um, which have been phenomenal. Um, she did an intense study on 101 verbal abusers speak out. Mm -hmm. Plus she wrote the book, Controlling People. Um, and emotional abuse, you know, it was horrific to read those stories, but I had to go through each and every one of them. Um, talking to psychologists, talking to psychiatrists. I work with a medical doctor for the series, um, and it's just, it is what it is. And what we um, think you guys, because our time is going to be up and our Zoom call is going to click off on us <laughs> in here in a minute. So thank you guys, because we really were helpful and I'm sure like this is something that would have been great for you to have watched Andrew when you were creating your wonderful character. I wish I wish someone had done this <laughs> um, thank you. but thank you both. We'll put the links to your organizations underneath the video and thank you for joining us on Story Mantra and we'll see you next week.